Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today we are continuing our Cao Cao Let's Talk lore series with episode 4 of Act 1, titled Yuan Shao and Cao Cao. So previously, we laid the groundwork by discussing the different partisan groups that held power within the Han government, and today we're going to build on that by looking at how Cao Cao would self-identify with these groups to find his own place at court. So clearly growing up, Cao Cao was classified first and foremost as the grandson of a eunuch. Yet Cao Cao himself felt no particular attachment to this classification, as after all, he never really had a chance to even know this grandfather of his, as Cao Teng passed away to old age when Cao Cao was only 4 years old. And by the time that Cao Cao was at an age when he could remember things, he probably only associated himself as a member of the gentry class, as his father, Cao Song, looked the part as a rising star in the imperial court thanks to the immense political capital left behind by Cao Teng. So in everyone else's mind, Cao Song was firmly entrenched in the eunuch's camp, and by proxy, Cao Cao belonged to it as well. First off, Cao Song got his start in government through the second marquis title left behind by Cao Teng, and when the second party incident occurred in 168, under the new child emperor Liu Hong, the eunuchs scored an even more astounding victory over the scholars, led this time by the regent Dou Wu, who ended up being casted as a traitor and usurper, even though his original plan had only targeted the eunuchs and not the emperor. But unfortunately, this falsified crime caused scores of scholars to lose their jobs at court as they were imprisoned, killed, or banned from serving at court for life. And naturally, this led to a lot of vacancies at court, which people like Cao Song, who were allies of the eunuch, filled in quite nicely. So in 169, Cao Song rose to one of the most coveted nine minister positions, namely the Minister of Agriculture, which was in charge of all the taxations on the land. And unlike his adopted father, Cao Teng, who was unmoved by wealth, Cao Song was the poster boy of greed and corruption that was rampant during this period of rule by Emperor Liu Hong, who would eventually even join in his own eunuchs in personally selling government positions and titles. So by putting Cao Song in the place of an important position that would deal with money and food, we can safely say that not all the taxes make their way to the national treasury, as in a short 20 years, Cao Song would end up paying the record-breaking price of 1 million to buy the position of Grand Commandant directly from the Emperor himself, only to resign after 6 months in order to help the Emperor sell the position once again. Yet for young Cao Cao, who was only 14 when Cao Song rose to become the Minister of Agriculture, he did not see the eunuch connections involved, or at the very least, he didn't want to see them. As in his mind, he wanted to be like his peers. I mean, who could blame Cao Cao for thinking this way? In his mind, he checked all the boxes for being a member of the gentry class. First, he went to school at Taishue, in the capital, where his teachers were renowned scholars from the gentry class who preached the evils of eunuchs and the injustices of the two party incidents. Secondly, his classmates and peers were largely from the gentry class, and much like their fathers, his own father was also a highly ranked government official. And to top it all off, he was probably the wealthiest kid at school, behind only a few key clans like the Yuan clan of Runan. And speaking of the Yuan clan of Runan, we have to talk about the budding friendship that was formed between Cao Cao and Yuan Shao during their time together at school. Now even though we don't know the exact birth year for Yuan Shao, we do know that he was a few years older than Cao Cao, and that they had met through a mutual friend at school named Zhang Miao. And the two of them hit it off right away, probably due to the fact that they were both the sons of a concubine, and they were both marginalized at school to some degrees for certain reasons. And for Cao Cao, that reason was pretty clear. No matter how charismatic he was, or how much he rejected his own eunuch's connection, 
the label of the eunuch grandson would follow him and haunt him, and that would lead to him being marginalized at school, filled with other gentry class children. And for Yuan Shao, the reason is a bit more complicated. Hailing from the prestigious Yuan clan, he was the eldest child of Yuan Feng, but his mother was just a maid when he was conceived. And even though his father would eventually elevate her to the position of a concubine, he would go on to have other sons, namely Yuan Shu, with his main wife. Which means that unlike Cao Cao, Yuan Shao was no longer in line to inherit anything from his own father. But fortunately for him, his father's older brother never had a son, so he was passed on as a spare. To be adopted by his father's older brother, and thus all of a sudden, he was now the heir to the main branch of the Yuan clan, which made Yuan Shu, who had grown up knowing that he was much better than the son of a maid, very bitter, and he went out of his way to ensure that his fellow classmates knew that Yuan Shao was just the son of a maid and thus beneath him. So perhaps it was circumstances like these that bonded Yuan Shao and Cao Cao, who started to hang out together more during school and after, as these two charismatic and ambitious teenagers soon became famous troublemakers in the capital. And one of their most famous or infamous feats was their attempt to steal a bride on her wedding night, as the two young men played the role of wedding crashers. And in this story, Yuan Shao and Cao Cao. Anonymously infiltrated a grand wedding reception in the capital, and after quickly becoming bored of the event, they falsely alerted the host that they had seen thieves sneak into the back of the house. And when the wedding party started to look for these thieves, Cao Cao and Yuan Shao snuck back into the room where the bride was waiting and kidnapped her in a foolish display of childish enthusiasm. Now, of course, they were not going to get very far trying to steal a living human being. So they had to quickly abandon their prize as they tried to flee away from the pursuing guards from the wedding reception, and it was said during this escape that Yuan Shao would trip and fall into this ivory-covered ditch, but instead of helping him out, Cao Cao would run off to a safe distance. Before, in another display of childishness, he would yell out to the pursuers that the group that they'd been chasing had now fallen into the ditch to lead them to a struggling Yuan Shao. Now Yuan Shao did eventually get away, as he had no desire to get captured and identified, as it would surely tarnish the Yuan clan's family name. And according to some sources, because of this incident, Yuan Shao even considered hiring a hitman to teach Cao Cao a lesson. But ultimately, he decided against it, as this incident, like many others, are just ways for these two teenage boys to show off their friendship in the purest and most childish of ways. But eventually, boys have to grow up to become men, and the future that awaited Yuan Shao and Cao Cao after school was a life at court. But as we mentioned in an earlier episode, during this period, the Han government did not have standardized exams for scholars to take to get government jobs. Instead, talented individuals must get recommendations from well-respected scholars or current officials to have a chance to join the court. And to secure these recommendations, you needed to have talents, but more importantly, you needed connections. For Yuan Shao, this was never going to be a problem, as he hailed from the Yuan clan, who had three grand excellencies in the past four generations of their clan. So their roots in the imperial court ran deep, and this means countless officials got their jobs because of recommendations from past Yuan clan members. Thus, when any Yuan clan member needed a recommendation, everyone was eager to repay the favor, regardless of how deserving or undeserving the candidate was. But for someone with real talents like Yuan Shao, he chose to go through proper channels or through Yue Dan Ping, which is the public system of recommendations where you get judged by a renowned scholar from your own hometown, and his hometown of Runan. Would happen to have one of the most famous Yue Danpings throughout the empire, as Xu Shao, alongside his brother, ran this very well accepted and very prestigious recommendation system in Runan. So, getting a recommendation from his mouth was going to be a surefire ticket to a job at court, 
and whether it was due to Yuan Shao's own natural talents or out of a respect to the Yuan clan as a whole, Xu Shao recommended Yuan Shao. But Cao Cao's road to a recommendation was much more difficult. Certainly, he could have relied on his grandfather's political network or a colleague of his father's to recommend him, but Cao Cao rejected these approaches as he viewed them as a form of corruption and he thought himself as a true scholar who has gone through Tai Xue and not a lapdog of the eunuchs. So if Yuan Shao could receive such a coveted recommendation from the legendary Xu Shao, then Cao Cao wanted one too. So he made a journey to Runan to get judged himself for such a recommendation. Yet this whole process is much more complicated than Cao Cao had imagined, as Cao Cao is not born in Runan and not even related to the city. So Xu Shao rejected his demands to be judged there, as after all, the judgment was not only based on talent, but also on character. So if Cao Cao is not from the area, then who can really judge his character? But Cao Cao was tenacious, and he was not going to let this trip go to waste, as he bought gifts in an attempt to bribe Xu Shao, before finally just resorting to shadowing Xu Shao everywhere he went in the city, pleading to get some sort of recommendation from him. And after two days of being followed and bothered by Cao Cao, Xu Shao finally relented and gifted Cao Cao the famous recommendation of Zhi Shi Zhi Neng Chen, Luan Shi Zhi Jian Xiong which roughly translate to, you will become a capable minister in a time of peace, or a treacherous warlord in a time of chaos. And with this recommendation, Cao Cao was satisfied as he laughed and left Runan to go back to the capital to receive his first government job. Now, there are actually two versions of Xu Shao's appraisal of Cao Cao, depending on which source you use. The one that we are using here is the one from the Romance of Three Kingdoms, which is sourced from another historical text. But in our next episode, we're going to dig deeper into these two versions of the famous appraisal and also take a look at Cao Cao's first government job to see if he is indeed a capable minister in a time of peace. So hopefully you all enjoy this episode and I'll see you all next time. Bye!